Welcome to the Molecular Moments Podcast. In today's episode, we sat down with our guests, Dr. Jolly Mazumdar and Dr. Tim Chandramada, CEO and CSO of Chimeron Bio. These two are the dynamic duo of the next generation of RNA therapeutics. They are pharma industry veterans who ventured out to start their own company. It's a fascinating story of belief in a technology and themselves. I hope you'll enjoy our conversation as much as I did. We're talking science as scientists do. So without further ado, here is another episode of Molecular Moments. Welcome to the podcast, Jolly and Tim. I'm delighted to have you join me today. This is my first episode with two guests, which I think is very exciting. Can we start with you giving us a few highlights from your career? And uh, Jolly, how about you go ahead and start? Certainly. First of all, Chad and team, thank you for this opportunity to share our story with your audience. My background, I'm a scientist by training. I grew up in India, and therefore it's fair to say it was very hard for me to escape infectious diseases. And uh, quite early on, uh, I just fell in love with the concept of bugs and the drugs that you need to cure them. And basically, it was that passion I followed, and there were some other influences, and we can get to it later. But it was a passion I followed. I came to the United States for my graduate studies. Initially, I stayed with infectious diseases. Uh, I did that at the University of Georgia. That's where I got my PhD. However, I also realized that for me to get into the industry, I needed to do something that was more relevant. So after my PhD, I came to University of Pennsylvania to do my postdoc. And this time I focused more on human biology, mammalian uh, system, stem cells, cancer biology. And it kind of paid off because it was that training that got me to GSK, uh, GlaxoSmithKline Pharmaceuticals, where I did oncology drug development. And I must say it was that foundation which ultimately helped us start Chimeron Bio. Tim, how about you? That's a, that's a great story. Chad, first of all, I echo uh, Jolly's comments. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and uh, share our experience with your audience. So I started my career as an agriculturist, and that was primarily due to two main factors. I come from a lineage of uh, coffee growers in a mountainous region in South India called Kurg. So I know a little bit of how the coffee bean gets to our breakfast table. Uh, And secondly, uh, a dad was in the animal science industry. I think these two factors primarily contributed to me pursuing a a career in agriculture. However, over time, uh, I realized I could have more of an impact on my aging parents and my loved ones around me if I pursue a research in medical medical sciences. So uh, I approached uh, a scientist at the Vistar Institute here in Philadelphia. Uh, I promised to work hard, though I did not know anything about my medical sciences. Uh, and uh, incidentally, that happened to be in RNA biology. And that kind of laid the foundation to me pursuing therapeutics in mRNA as well as vaccines. I have to ask, you don't usually think of India generating coffee. Of course, it seems like the the environment is is ripe for it, right? But uh, so can you get Indian coffee in, in the U.S.? Do you see it much? I do not know about in the in the U.S., but definitely uh, we export our coffee to the European uh, Union, and that's where uh, the, it is processed, and that's where we see it grow. I'd love to try some. I I love coffee, and I, I have an espresso, and I I get the like different pods from all over the world, and I just was like, do they have one from India? Maybe someday. Definitely. <laughs> Back to the science. So um, I'm fascinated with uh, what you guys did at GSK and your time there, uh, Jolly. I guess you were more on the biomarker side, and Tim, you were more on the development side. Tell me, Jolly, a little bit more about uh, your GSK career, how that prepared you for what what you're doing now at Chimeron Bio. It's a great question because without the training, I won't be doing what I'm doing today. At GlaxoSmithKline, I joined at a very interesting time. Uh, The reason I say this is we were at that time heavily focused on pushing a couple of skin cancer drugs to the market. When I joined, I had the privilege of getting involved in early stage clinical trials. So I joined the clinical development side. And what I got to experience in those two years is what you can deliver when a big pharma is behind you when they're committed. It was a lot of uh, the things we were trying to achieve through these targeted therapies for melanoma. Uh, It was highly innovative. 
I was in the biomarker division. And what that meant is I got to, you know, it was an era of personalized medicine. I got to not only develop, but also execute strategies around how do we select patients such that we can With a low number of patients, we can maximize efficacy of the drug. It's all about selecting the right patient. That's what I learned. But also uh, the regulators, they require you to come up with something known as uh, companion diagnostic. It's to uh, basically say that if we are claiming that this drug will be effective for such a patient, we are also obligated to develop a test which will facilitate that. And again, highly innovative uh, project for GSK. I was leading that. And, you know, seeing a drug programs that you are working on ultimately becoming drugs and hearing from the families who took those drugs or, or patients rather who took those drugs and the impact it made. We used to get those emails. We got to meet those patients and the families. Uh, that That is an ultimate privilege for a scientist. Uh, so in my seven years, I was part of three such programs. And again, uh, that was indeed the foundation for me to say, yes, I know how to make drugs. Chimeron Chaser is a great technology. Let's just go for it. That's really cool. So were the drugs you're involved uh, at GSK, were they RNA therapeutics as well? They're not. They were two were small molecule. One was biologics, uh, an antibody based drug. But my connection to what we are doing today is coming from oncology space, that time CAR T just got approved. And for me, it was always about, but there's a void and how do we fill that void? And when I first looked at our technology, it was a very simplistic vision. It's like, okay, we know this technology can serve such and such unmet need in oncology, but we have, of course, morphed way beyond that today. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. So, Tim, how about you? Can I talk about your role at GSK a little bit. So I started off as a, as a bench scientist at uh, GlaxoSmithKline. I think it was quite different, as you can imagine, uh, Chad, from uh, academia. It taught me a lot of things. It taught me about uh, teamwork. You cannot develop a drug uh, without bringing in a team and working coherently to eventually lead the project, deliver what, what is to be delivered to, to the patient. The other thing that I learned is uh, at GSK, we had a very good patient insight seminar where patients used to come and share their experiences. I think that was a huge motivating factor. It made me go back to the lab, made me do good science, and ultimately the vision uh, was to eventually help these patients, also help these aging population so that they age better in a dignified manner. And that is what drove my science. That's fantastic. So how do you take it from that tremendous amount of experience uh, in a big pharma where there's all the support in the world? If you have a great idea, you can probably get money for it, right? Uh, with a little bit of with a little bit of hard work. But then all of a sudden you guys uh, popped out of GSK, I think around 2017 and start this company Chimeron Bio. What was really the inspiration there? You talked a little bit about it, but tell me how, how do you jump off that cliff? Because, man, that's like a cliff. That, that's amazing. For me, it was an easier path because quite a few things were happening, which all culminated to the same answer for me. This was a time, I'm talking around 2015, when I was also finishing my MBA at Columbia Business School. And we had pushed the drugs through the pipeline and things were a little slow for me at GSK. And I was wondering, OK, what is it that I want to do? So it was truly the urge of, OK, how can I challenge myself more? What should I do? And at the same time, from the business school perspective, I had started asking my question. I got this MBA. How do I use it? I mean, what's really the best way for me to use it? And at around the same time, and I was really struggling, you know, they say for change to happen, you must really be wanting for something. So I was extremely restless. And I came across this opportunity that the NIH had put forth. Uh, it, it was what I thought was a beautiful technology, which can be applied in oncology. It was in the space of RNA. And they had put it up for licensing. Uh, for me, it was a no brainer. I said, OK, we should apply for it. It took a couple of years, and once and I just said we were going to get it, I quit my job. So when Jolly showed me this technology, and it happened to be in RNA biology, uh, and I was like, this is something that could revolutionize the way we look at mRNA therapeutics, which was at that time still in its infancy. Glad to know, you know, even a common man is now realizes what mRNA, the power of mRNA is. So when she showed me this technology, I was like, this is one we need to develop, and, you know, 
she's my wife. I would love to join her in the journey. So I uh, decided to quit and form Cameron Bio. And it has been a very interesting and very remarkable experience so far. Well, I can, I can tell if you want to jump on the ride with somebody, I can tell Jolly is a great person to uh, to partner up with. I mean, the enthusiasm is awesome. And the humility is, um, <laughs> I'm kind of taken back. You said, uh, how can you challenge yourself more? And I'm thinking, let's see, start your own pharmaceutical company. Yeah, that's probably about at the top of the list. I'm not sure, you know, maybe uh, like pro basketball player or something like that. That might have been harder <laughs> for you to do, but I am just absolutely uh, blown away that you guys took this lead. I just don't even know where you would start with that. So you downplayed a little bit, I feel like, but to take that leap and and leave an, an amazing company like GSK with all that security, doing great things for human health, and then quit and like I'd I'd probably panic the next day, right? Like, oh my God, I just quit my job. What do I do now? Yes. And of course, we have been asked this question. I, I quit first and Tim Tim joined. So it's not that we both jumped at the same time. But nevertheless, and my only answer is, uh, I'm a selfish person. I need to be happy. As simple as that. I chase happiness. And for me, once I truly twist this love for this technology and what it could do, that's what we bet on. And it was maybe not easy, but because uh, that's where the confidence, the courage and uh, your training, I guess, comes into. And there were a lot of things about setting up a company that we didn't know But the one thing I really felt comfortable, I felt I knew, and with Tim's support, we knew is how to make drugs. It was too good for us to not act on, or at least personally for me not to act on. And I was actually super happy the day I resigned. Good for you. And and, uh, and Tim, how long was it before you joined? So I joined uh, around the time we got the license. Uh, so once we got the license from the NIH, it was time for us to set up uh, a lab, uh, a small lab in the, at the University City Center here in Philadelphia. So uh, it was then, uh, and the first thing we wanted to know, Chad, is whether we can make the drug, whether this is something is, 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 which is viable. And uh, once we once we, we showed that, we, uh, sh- then we presented it to uh, investors. And that for me was a bigger challenge because for the past 12 years, I've been talking to scientists. I've been dealing with scientists. And, uh, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, now talking to investors uh, at a different level, for me was a, a, a learning experience. So it was about a year, I would say nine months to one year. We staggered that way. So doing these presentations, trying to get uh, funding, trying to communicate your science in a way that's going to appeal to um, Wall Street types, right? But but these are big money uh, individuals that you're looking uh, to finance. So how does that feel? Uh, it was intimidating in the very beginning, Chad, needless to say. And a couple of uh, uh, maybe three, three or four uh, uh, presentations uh, did require a lot more explanation than, than did the other ones. So uh, we did understand uh, we slowly and slowly we did understand what they were Uh, what they wanted to know. Science was an aspect of it. It was the business side as well. And in a way, the MBA from Colombia did help us, did prep us. And the support that we got from the Colombia community after we quit uh, and formed this company was indeed very useful for us to uh, set up this company and uh, lead it from there. We are all going through a horrible time, right? Through the pandemic. But in our case, that was kind of the silver lining. Explaining our story to the community became much easier. In 2017 and 18, when we were trying to talk about mRNA not to ma- and self-amplifying RNA, people really didn't realize. And now we see the excitement or that nod, oh, okay, that's what you guys are doing. So things have evolved. And of course we have matured and our commitments have grown. It's not been an easy ride, but it's been a fun ride. Tell me about Chimeron, the company. Where are you at now? How big is it? Where are you at with your, your pipeline development and your, di- and your different products? So the way we started, we knew that there is this great technology we're sitting with, but that was on paper. We had to first make sure that it's indeed what it promises to be. And the only commitment we had was just to push it, push it, push it. We therefore did not really have the luxury of waiting for institutional investors. And we started bootstrapping So initially, we kept the company small. As Tim mentioned, we got a small lab space in Philadelphia, and we wanted to address very simple and 
but extremely critical questions like, can we even make this? Because for it to be a drug, you have to first make it. Do we understand it? And we did so for about two years and gradu- then we and during this process, we started getting advisors and we started building a board and then that brought in some money. And and before, you know, you know, like first quarter 2020, like last year, we were just so confident about this technology. We said it's great time for us to now announce a pipeline. And it's a platform technology. It truly has brought applicability. And the best part is it's very modular. So if we were to partner with strategic partners, you know, each partner could do whatever they wanted to do with it. Some could say we want to make accessible vaccines. Some can say, oh, we want to go after the very, like, you know, exclusive rare diseases. And so we said, let's keep pushing this technology. We announced a pipeline. Our commitment right now is oncology, cancer vaccines, infectious diseases and rare diseases, we were not thinking of infectious diseases slash COVID vaccine, but then once we truly understood what this pandemic, you know, you know, the havoc it's going to wreak, we said we have to act because we know our technology can be applied there. So where today we are much better positioned to really start pushing or thinking about clinical development, entering the clinic, morphing this company from preclinical stage to clinical, and now also we are starting to uh, get serious about investment talking to the big institutional investors and expanding. We have built a team and we plan to build further. How many employees do you have today? So right now, we have a team of eight scientists, but we have a much broader, you know, behind the scene network of consultants, advisors and service providers. It's it's we have morphed. Yeah, well, you're, someday you're going to look back, you're going to have a company of 500 people or something like that. And say, oh, those days when we had eight people, those were the good days, you know, and uh, dreaming big. And, you know, I'm, I'm, so I'm sure that's, you know, it's something exciting to look forward to. You know, we started off with two. two. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just sure. Charlie and I. And then, uh, you know, we got the right support. And I, I am thankful to uh, all our advisors and our, our, our and our board who believed in us and who, who basically laid the foundation for the growth of Chimeron. I'm glad we are now at eight scientists, I think. And the, the work that we are doing, Chad, it directly impacts the society, directly impacts. And we have also started a new board called the Accessible Medicine board whose major goal is to look at uh, other de- developing countries and see if they can transfer our technology there so that they can make their own mRNA vaccine in indigenously built mRNA vaccine that they can distribute it to their own uh, to, to the people of their country and not necessarily depend upon others which is currently a challenge for developing countries especially when it comes to covid-19 vaccines so I'm very proud of that effort, yes. and I hope that materializes and it gives us an opportunity to showcase our platform uh, worldwide. Wow. I mean, the story just gets better and better, right? I mean, it's amazing science, an amazing mission, helping the third world. I, 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 I love this. So I've been really anxious to discuss the a couple of topics, but understanding the science. So it's kind of like, okay, this is what I've been waiting for, is to have you explain to me what is the self-amplifying RNA in the, in the chimera encased uh, self-amplifying RNA. So uh, let's hear about it. I, I want to understand what's going on. So the CHASER, uh, which stands for chimera encased self-amplifying RNA, is nothing but a nanoparticle that encases a single piece of RNA. The shell around it is coming from a a different viral family. The RNA is coming from a different viral family. So it's in a way, in a sense, it's a chimera. So it is chimera encased self-amplifying RNA. The beauty of, of this is once it gets into the cell, this single piece of RNA is delivered and this RNA self amplifies itself. So uh, a single copy of RNA eventually leads to around 100,000 or more copies. So in a sense, what therapeutically, when you're looking or from a vaccine wise, a single small, a lower dose of this vaccine gives you a much more amplified response. So Tim, how, how is that different from the mRNA vaccines that are out now that utilize the ribosome to produce more? It is the same mechanism, but our dose is much lower. 
So from a single dose of mRNA, you get much more amplified response because of our technology. So when you're looking at some of the companies that are at 100 micrograms of vaccine, we are seeing uh, efficacy at 10 nanograms, so 10,000 less. How does that impact vaccines is a single batch of our vaccine can vaccinate many more people than the current vaccines that are in the market. Furthermore, this Chaser technology can be stored at four degrees, that is the normal refrigerator, which helps in the supply and distribution chain of a vaccine across the globe, not necessarily, that does not need the ultra cold temperatures that we currently need. Yeah. You asked, how are we different from other mRNA? If we think of them as a linear technology, end of the day, a body needs protein to have a response. And this protein is formed because of RNAs. So other technologies are linear, where you could think of one mRNA giving rise to one protein molecule. We are self-amplifying RNA. One RNA that we deliver ends up giving 100,000 protein molecules. And that is what allows us to call ourselves a low-dose technology, because we don't have to dose as much to get to the required amount of protein. And then combined with some of the other factors Tim mentioned, first of all, it's a low-dose technology, easy to make, easy to store, it is low cost, but most importantly, it's highly flexible. We can put a lot of genes in and out. It's a flexible technology that can be adapted across therapeutic areas. And that's what makes it very powerful. So what you're seeing right now in the COVID-19 space is uh, the development of new variants, which, uh, which are causing more deleterious effects than the original ones. So our technology helps develop a, a super COVID or a next generation COVID-19 vaccine, where you not only have the original antigen, but also you can embed within the single strand of RNA the other antigens as well, so that the patient gets exposed to those antigens and produces those antibodies against the new variants as well. So that flexibility uh, is given by the uh, self-amplifying property of the uh, of the Chaser technology. Yeah. So what makes it self-amplify, I guess, uh, to replicate? How does that part work? Because that, that's the part I really don't understand. I'm a I'm a chemist and not a not a biologist, so I might be missing something. So within the single strand of RNA that is delivered, there are genes that encode for protein complex called RNA dependent RNA polymerase complex. So once that polymerase complex is made within the cell, it then binds to the promoter regions of the uh, RNA and makes, so we not only deliver the RNA, but we deliver the uh, machinery that is responsible for converting that RNA into the antigen. And you know, it's nature, Chad. Nature is very powerful. Nature has a small family of viruses, or, or rather a family of small viruses called alpha virus. They inherently do this. Uh, they have what is known as self-amplifying RNA because uh, they are so tiny, they can't afford to have a lot of capability. And, and it's really, it's the scientists over time, they have exploited that particular property to start clinical applications. And what Chimeron, what we are now doing is taking it a step further to really how we make it is so different that our intellectual property is really around that. We have borrowed something that nature had offered and made it smarter and smarter. You said this technology came from the NIH initially. What's kind of the backstory on the, on the development of this technology? What we understand is that apparently due to some budget sequestration issues, some departments had to close down. And these technologies coming out of those labs were put for licensing under a program where, true to its spirit of advancing science, they had allocated some of these technologies to for startup companies. That's how they wanted to promote scientific growth. So this technology under that program could not, let's say, have gone to an established company. You had to be a startup, less than five employees, less than $5 million raised. We fit that bill. We founded the company just so we could be eligible to get the license and we got it. That's super cool. So I know Joe Biden listens to my podcast. Um, maybe other people didn't know that, but but I hope Joe, you know, when he hears this, that he'll think about funding the NIH and keeping these programs going because these are the these are the sorts of things that come out of it. But I, I like the story though that it came out of the NIH. I, you know, the, the you know losing some funding and then it kind of becomes this you know program in limbo. I love that you guys could pick that up. I think it's a perfect way to 
to sort of make these things happen. So that's uh, that's cool. I mean, where are you at in your vaccine development timeline and in, in your uh, in your plans here to uh, to get this thing to market? So we have finished critical proof of concept studies in mice. And then now we are looking to do safety toxicity studies, which is an essential requirement for the regulators to say, yes, now you can go into human. What is our timeline? We expect to have a vaccine, our vaccine in the market next year, later half of next year. But, you know, for us, that works because right now we really don't know how the vaccine regimen is going to turn up. I mean, do we need annual vaccines? Secondly, we are talking a pandemic. There's a global population under question, and there's still many countries that do not have vaccines. And I think the thirdly and the most important aspect, in addition to what Tim had mentioned earlier, this we, we want these countries to be self-reliant and we are very infrastructure friendly. But most importantly, you know, we want to be thinking of the next pandemic or the next epidemic. We want to think beyond COVID. And does our technology fit in that category of a robust transformative vaccine platform? Absolutely. Therefore, as we progress, you know, we don't get distracted by who's there, who's not there. It's more like think of today, but think of the longer term prospect as well. What the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines have shown, uh, Chad, is that mRNA is here to stay. It's a viable option. Now we look to expand this further. And that is what Chimeron is trying to do as well uh, around hepatitis B around tuberculosis, can we around influenza, can mm-hmm. we now have a more potent and a reliable vaccine? And mRNA has shown that. And that is what we want to take uh, take forward is to develop the next generation of vaccines and also be ready should, uh, God forbid, but should another pandemic arise, we should be ready to go. And mRNA has shown the way. Yeah. And I will add one other thing that while this vaccine effort is ongoing, We are also heavily focused on developing our pipeline when it comes to oncology and rare diseases. Um, You know, we do not intend to be a vaccine company or one vaccine company, but rather a company with a highly transformative and useful RNA technology so we can truly maximize the impact. Do you have any partnerships that you can talk about with any, any of the companies? We don't have any executed yet, but we are under several discussions. And that's the hope that we will secure a partnership sooner than later. Because we'll need, as we go to clinical development, we definitely need partners. Yeah, develop, going to clinical development with eight people would be uh, would be more than a challenge. So uh, Absolutely. That, that's exciting. I, you know, I mean, we're, we're obviously, this isn't a video, but you guys can see how much I'm smiling. This is really, uh, really amazing. And I feel like, wow, in a year, I'm going to say, hey, I, go back and listen to my podcast with these guys. This is, uh, you know, this is on CNN now. You know, you'll be talking to Anderson Cooper and not Chad Briscoe. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm really excited for you. And uh, this is really cool. Are there other diseases outside of uh, coronavirus type diseases that these vaccines can apply to? Absolutely. As Tim mentioned, we are already starting to think about influenza. We're starting to think about tuberculosis. You know, if you think of global impact, World Health Organization has a whole host of uh, infectious agents for which there's really no vaccine and they're actively looking Our technology, because of its simplicity, really allows us to tackle many of those. And again, if depending on the markets we are looking at, uh, there are others like uh, hepatitis B, HPV. So it all depends. But uh, simply put, is there an opportunity beyond COVID-19? Yes, there's tremendous opportunity and and we are mindful and we are going to go after it. It's fantastic. And and by the way, I was going to mention that I, I agree with you, I think. While I'd like to think that in a year, year and a half, that we're past COVID around the world, I don't, I don't think we will be. And, and you know, I think back a year ago when I sort of made my predictions as a, you know, citizen epidemiologist who knows nothing, right? I'm not an epidemiologist. I, I didn't think we'd be where we're at today. I thought we'd be in a better position than we are today. So but I think in a year, year and a half, when you guys have your vaccine on the market, there's still going to be a, a huge market for it. So why is it? So I'm sure a lot of listeners, this is going back to some notes I took, but why is it that your vaccine is stable at 4C and other vaccines are not stable uh, except at uh, frozen and, and, uh, and, and very frozen conditions? It's how we make it. It's inherent to the technology. Other mRNA vaccines, uh, you will 
hear of them as LNP, lipid nanoparticle. They use lipid to stabilize their RNA. RNA is very labile. If you do not stabilize, the body's going to chop it and you won't have an effect. But uh, as soon as you bring in the lipid, you know, storage does become an issue. If you see the vaccines that are uh, stored at lower temperature, usually they have some connection to viruses. And we believe because, again, how we make our it's not it's a non lipid technology. That's what's allowing us to uh, create stable products. And it's a very sturdy, sturdy particle based on what we're yeah, seeing. So the protein coat around the uh, RNA, Chad, is coming from an inert virus. So that protein coat is pretty stable. And that partly contributes for the stability of the vaccine. Is it an adenovirus? It's not an adenovirus. It is coming from a very different viral family. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and we were fortunate enough that this did show tremendous. I think uh, right now we are seeing more, greater than three months uh, at four degrees and they're quite stable. And we also do freeze thaw. We put it in ultra cold and take it out, ultra cold, take it out. And it, it's just, it holds steady. And, and the reason I mention it, because in development, we may also envision a situation where we make a big batch and we have to do long-term storage. And it's only when it's time to supply, we go into four degrees C. And, you know, the data that we see really supports that theory. If we have to do that, we can do it. Wow, you guys, this is this is super cool. I'm just I'm, I'm so excited for you guys and, and what you're doing and, and excited to see this technology come along. So absolutely wonderful. I have to ask you about our mutual friend, Afshin Savavi. How did you get hooked up with that guy? And but also how fortunate of you to get hooked up with that guy, right? Um, I feel the same way. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, initially, it was, you know, Tim and me largely trying to secure investment, etc. It was indeed that reason. We, we dug deeper into our network. And then somebody, we had a mutual connection. That's how we got introduced to Afshin. And we had one chat, and then a second chat. And by the third chat, we were quite we just knew it was a fit and he's been amazing. I mean, through his connections, uh, how, how we keep the morale of the company high, uh, every aspect, uh, he's, he's, been, he's been wonderful. Yeah, I do want to share a story though here. Uh, when Jolly did talk to him initially and he was interested, but as you can imagine, uh, Afshin, a very dynamic person, but at the same time, a very, very busy person. So he came back the following week and said, you have a great technology, guys, but I do not have the time. Uh, so unfortunately, I will not be able to, uh, you know, help, help you or be part of Chimeron. And this happened while we were going to the grocery store. So uh, we had the kids at the back and uh, they were all having fun and we are our we were feeling, we felt sad. We deflated, felt sad yeah, that yeah, deflated, yeah, deflated at this yeah, point because yeah. we knew he could he could make an impact. And at that point, we thought for five minutes, and, uh, and I told Jolly, call him back, please, call him back, and let's have a meeting again. So we did. Uh, Jolly did, and uh, somehow was able to convince him join the board, and that started uh, the next Chimeron Bio and a more successful Chimeron Bio. Mm-hmm. He has sold on you guys and your technology, and and obviously he's uh, he's the one that, that you know introduced me to you and and convinced me that yeah this is this is the next thing in, in RNA therapeutics and RNA delivery and I and I'm super excited about it. You talked a little bit, well, actually, you talked a lot about the future of Chimeron and some of your thoughts going forward. Thinking big, where do you think you might take the company down the road? What are what are some of your other future plans? Maybe that that we didn't touch on, if any. I'm driven and committed to one thing, make products, see it in the market. But as you can appreciate, as that happens, that can't happen without company growth. And how we end up looking, whether, you know, we just stay private and become a big company or we go public, we are, one thing Chimeron is, and all of us are unified in that spirit, we are are opportunity driven. We do not discount anything. Uh, we give everything considerable attention or, or whatever attention it, it deserves. Bottom line is we will let our drugs dictate how we grow. And as execs uh, and the board, we are committed to making good drugs. So what we have here, uh, Chad, is a very, very tiny nanoparticle with enormous potential. 
So with uh, COVID, with the uh, oncology vaccine and the rare disease, we are just touching the tip of the iceberg at this point. There's a lot more to be done. That is exciting for me. The, uh, the scientists at Chimeron are ex excited about the upcoming things, the things now that uh, vaccines are an option. We are looking to, uh, looking at other countries as well, like countries in uh, countries in the African continent where you can develop some vaccines that uh, to prevent some of the diseases there. So the potential is unlimited, and that is where that is how I see Cameron progress, develop this technology further, have a good pipeline, and make an impact. I think that's where it we we stand. Make an impact to the society, come up with novel drugs, come up with innovative drugs. And that is what we want to do. And accessible drugs. And accessible drugs, so absolutely. That everybody can access. I love that. that. That means a lot to me as well. And I've had so many conversations with different individuals over the last uh, few months talking about accessibility to, to drugs, whether it's in Central America or if it's in Africa. I have uh, several good friends with the Gates Foundation and different, different organizations that are, uh, that are working on accessible drugs. And it's super exciting. And, you know, including this country, actually, we should not discount, including what we think are the Western, select Western markets, because if you look at right now the way gene therapy is shaping up, those the, the cost is, is it's prohibitive, and that's where I mean at some point payers they, they will they will put their foot down, and these are critical stakeholders. So it's you know when we say access, and there's inequity everywhere, and so again it depends how so that's where you know how smart are we? What's our strategy? Uh, because each therapeutic area has its own strategy. And we're just trying to be as attentive as possible. Can you deliver other drugs and other things other than RNA in these uh, uh, nanoparticles? Theoretically, yes. Have we have we tried? Uh, we could potentially del deliver antibodies. And one of the things that this technology can do, uh, Chad, it can direct uh, the RNA or an antibody to a particular tissue of interest. So we could be tagging along an antibody to eventually deliver it to that system. So that is something that we can do. Uh, again, as I said, we are just starting to understand this platform. RNA is, is definitely leading the front, leading, leading it, and hopefully the other antibodies or maybe even small molecules at some point will be uh, the future of Chimeron. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm dreaming along with you. So uh, so that's super cool. One of the things that we talk a lot about in, um, in Molecular Moments is uh, mentoring and, and the mentors that you had. Would love to have you touch on some of that. You talked about folks at Columbia and, and uh, Afshin and other people. Are there any interesting mentorship stories that, that you have? And, and how, how do you mentor the people that are coming into your organization? I'm interested in that as well. So for me, you know, it's like paid forward. It is paid forward. I don't have a mentor because as you know, as we grow, evolve, even mentors would evolve. My mentor is a hybrid chimeric creature because I draw inspiration from many different people. And I've had the privilege of working with, with really good people. My philosophy or mentorship when it comes to the new new team that we're building, first of all, we are very pro-growth. You know, I think it's stifling if you're in an organization where you can't grow. And my my personal motto is you need to have an environment where you're valued. That is something I value. So treat everybody with respect, feel valued, because if our team is not motivated, it's not going to happen. You know, they, they should feel excited about they, they should be wanting to come to Chimeron and wanting to do what they're doing. And, and that happens when they know there's a supportive environment where there's respect, where we value and what I tell my team is don't be afraid to fail because there is no such thing as fail. Figure it out. It's science. You know, if something doesn't work out, we just have to figure it out. We have to revisit the question. Um, that's my just keep encouraging. And, you know, I do it again for a selfish reason, because if they are happy, that makes me happy. That's how I operate. Yeah, pretty much on the same in the same side here, uh, Chad. No, uh, I don't have a mentor in mind because I have learned a lot from so many people. I, I, I you know, we, I, I went to Colombia because I was there for some lecture and I saw the lecture and saw the scholars there, and saw that they could 
is uh, the way the, the the knowledge they could imp- impart on me uh, that was phenomenal so i don't see a particular but i i, I don't see a particular person as a mentor i see the, the uh, life as being a mentor for me i learn from my uh, from my colleagues i have learned from my uh, reports as well the stories that they tell me those are motivating factors and those are, that's how i i uh, lead i lead my life as an example Wow. Yeah, you guys are just you're so inspiring. I think that's uh, that's fantastic. Jolly, your humility comes across, you know, you keep talking about, oh, I'm selfish about my happiness and I'm selfish because I want to do more for others. And I'm selfish because I want people to have a great work environment. And it's just it's it's a it's a beautiful thought. So thank you for that. It, it's just great. So um, I have a couple of fun questions I want to leave you guys with uh, or ask you guys before before I leave you. So Jolly and Tim, I'm guessing that when you were growing up, you didn't uh, you didn't think about, hey, when I grow up, I'm to be a CEO and a CSO of a pharmaceutical company uh, with life changing medicine. So, what were your dreams as uh, as children? Yeah, okay, I didn't like studies. I was, you know, for me, it was more about have fun, sing, dance, love to travel. Uh, got to do a lot of that just by virtue of you know what job my dad had. He was in business development. Those are the things that really mattered to me more. But then, uh, you know, when it was time to go to college, um, uh, there, there, there was a particular impact I didn't discuss further. That really became critical. So my mom is a medical technologist. And as a kid, I did talk about India. I would go to her with the hospital. I would see those long line of poor people waiting for some free medicine. Anyway, so when it was really time for me to pull my socks up and decide, I said, wow, I want to make drugs. That's something I've always wanted to do. In the early years, I got influenced, didn't think about it, but then it was time for me to make a decision. And after that, it was quite linear, as you heard, PhD, postdoc, yeah. Yeah, PhD at Georgia, postdoc at Howard <laughs> Hughes, you know, working at GSK. It's all, you know, no, no big, start your own pharma company. Yeah, no big deal. And I, I will tell you one thing, though, Chad, you asked me, right, CEO, did I ever think of it? Not at all. And actually, even today, I don't, that's, I don't look at it that way. I look at it as doing something I truly love with the people that I love. And I mean it. I wanted to always be a sports a sports person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like anyone else, uh, but in a sports in a, in field hockey. In fact, you know, it, field hockey. It's a different uh, here in, in the in India. It is a big deal. I think cricket when yeah. I think India, but yeah. cricket yeah. too. Yeah. Cri- oh, cricket! I did play cricket, but uh, field hockey was my passion. I did play for my state. It was after my twelfth grade that I seriously contemplated what I wanted to do. Agriculture did bring me back, and and that kind of drove me, uh, drove my career initially. That's awesome. Okay, so uh, I'm going to ask you one more, one more fun question. Boy, I can't imagine you guys have time to travel, but uh, with everything you're doing. But um, as travel opens up, what's on your travel bucket list, and why? Australia. Australia, yeah. Australia. I think that's one continent I've not uh, visited so far, uh, and the next one will be uh, the northern part of Africa. Uh, Chad, these are uh, two areas where I see, I see, and I just admire that place. These places, Jolly and I have traveled quite a lot, uh, and we uh, we we love it. She has a passion for travel. I have a passion for trying out different cuisines. I think. Uh, uh, that combination works for us, and that's what we did uh, before we started having kids. And, and and then you know what happens after that. Uh, <laughs> you, you go through a period of no travel, <laughs> right? For sure, yeah. yeah. And then and uh, another yeah, pandemic. but and another pandemic as well. So definitely would love to travel, uh, go to Australia at least for um, me and the northern part of Africa. Yeah. I'm just open to travel. I really need to travel because that's good for my brain. So I'll go wherever there's a chance. Nice. Nice. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, guys, uh, thank you so much for being guests on on the podcast today. This was uh, absolutely, it was brilliant, inspiring to hear your story. I just, I couldn't wish you more success because your success is going to be, I mean, it's to benefit the world, right? I mean, the whole world will succeed if you guys succeed. And that is, uh, that is an awesome, awesome thing that, you, that you're taking on and, and moving forward with. So I I hope you're successful and, and thank you. Any final parting comments uh, before we uh, before we part? 
Yes, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to share our story. You know, we could use good wishes. So thank you for that, too. You're welcome. Uh, we have a tough road ahead, but very exciting. And uh, we promise everybody to give it our best. Yeah, same here, uh, Chad. Thank you again. I'm glad we could share our story with you and your listeners. I hope someone draws inspiration from us and starts something of their own, which is unique and which is transformational and have an impact on our society and on on our world. So thank you again. And um, we hope to come back at some point. And I hope you invite us back. I would love to have you back. Oh, my gosh, because you'll be famous next time I have you back. So uh, so that'll be really, really cool. But uh, thank you so much. And that's all for this episode of Molecular Moments. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app so you never miss a conversation. If you'd like to hang out with us outside of the podcast, we have many webinars and other presentations available for your enjoyment and education. Visit bioagelytics.com to see what's coming up and how you can stay in touch. And don't forget to keep an eye out for more episodes coming soon. We're looking forward to some great guests. We'll have world-renowned experts talking about rare diseases, diversity in the pharmaceutical industry, new and exciting technologies, and a conversation with a patient who has benefited from the recent tremendous developments in our industry. Molecular moments would not be possible without the support of our sponsor, Bioagelytics Labs. Bioagelytics is a global contract research organization specializing in large molecule bioanalysis. Based in Durham, North Carolina with labs in Hamburg, Germany and Boston, Massachusetts, Bioagelytics provides high quality bioanalytical services to leading pharma and biotech companies around the world. They offer assay development, validation and sample analysis under non-GLP, GLP and GCP, as well as GMP quality control testing. If you are looking to work with a team of highly experienced scientific and QA professionals through all phases of clinical development, look no further than Bioagelytics. For more information or to speak with their scientists today, visit their website at www.bioagelytics.com. Thanks for listening to the Molecular Moments podcast.